Okay, it's time to start. Welcome everyone at our weekly colloquium. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Maciej Lisicki from uh, Faculty of Physics, University of Warsaw. Uh, Maciek uh, did his PhD uh, at uh, the Faculty of Physics, University of Warsaw. Then he spent a couple of years in Cambridge as a postdoc. And then, uh, as far as I remember, last year he returned back to Warsaw, where he now... That was half a year ago, actually. Well, half a in year ago. February. Okay. okay. And now he holds uh, uh, the permanent position uh, at the University of Warsaw Faculty of Physics. <laughs> and today uh, he will tell us uh, about pumping and swimming, uh, two phases of phoretic flows. Please. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to tell you bits about pumping and swimming in the context of phoretic flows, and I'm going to explain what this is all about. But I'm going to start with the inspiration, and the inspiration here is the micro world. So we try to look and understand how microorganisms move. And most of them move in an aqueous environment, or at least in a fluidic environment. And so the role of the fluid is really dominant. Um, in the in the in the life, and so well, let me start by introducing a couple of the heroes that are motivating this talk. And so, there in if you count how many microorganisms are there on Earth, they outnumber any other creature. If you count the cumulative mass of these organisms, that also outnumbers the cumulative mass of all other organisms. So there's there's an awful lot of them, but they come in a variety of shapes and flavors and sizes. And so, well, bacteria are probably the most numerous group there. And there are bacteria like E. coli, which is a working horse of the, of the bacterial world, which looks like a little sausage with these helical appendages. And it moves these helical appendages in a very particular way to achieve propulsion. Now, there are also um, bacteria that have more complicated shape, like, like this Pseudomonas here, that has, that has the, that its, its body is, he, is helical itself. And there are other examples, like Borrelia, that are, that are helices, and they don't have any appendages, they don't have any tails, they just move their bodies, and they deform their bodies in order to achieve propulsion. And this is, this is, this is a, a, a whole big world in which they come in a variety of ways. And they, they have a variety of swimming gates and swimming strategies. And, but we'll, we'll try to think about for a moment um, what is common to, to all these organisms. But then on the other hand, there are also organisms that are, belong to a different biological group, so eukaryotic organisms. So bacteria don't have a, a nucleus inside their cells. But then there are organisms which do have nuclei inside their cells, like us. And so... Example of, examples of these are Chlamydomonas, which is an alga. And it looks like, well, it, it's a little bean. This is the cell. The, it's a unicellular organism. And it has two appendages called cilia. And it moves them in a sort of breaststroke-like manner. But now the, it's, well, it has a cousin called Tetrahymena, which is a, a ciliate because it's all covered by tiny hairs. Now, these tiny hairs here, called cilia, are roughly the same size as bacterial flagella. Um, and they, it's covered, it's just much bigger. And it's covered with all these hairs, and it moves these hairs, again, in a particular way, which I will describe in detail, to achieve propulsion. So there is an awful lot of them, and there are different morphologies. No, but now, since we are interested in the physics of these organisms, we look for, for something that is universal, that is common to all of them. And the fact that it's common to all of them is that all of them live in a viscous fluid. And when you're on, this, on the scale of micrometers, these fluids are all very well behave in a very viscous way because the Reynolds number that's characterizing the flow is always very close to zero. It's very small, and therefore, um, well, any inertia in the fluid can be neglected. So one conclusion of that is that if you look at a swimming bacterium like E. coli, it has a, a flow field that from, well, close to the bacterium when it's moving, the flow is complicated. But when you look far away, in the far field, the flow looks, well, it has a sort of a simple structure. The fluid is dragged in from the sides and then ejected to the front and to the back. So this is for a moving, for a swimming bacterium. So if you look at a far field, well, this is a flow field we call a dipolar flow field. And how it comes about is, Basically, in a very viscous fluid, the drag force a body moving through a fluid experiences is proportional to its velocity. 
Now, what these guys do, they create certain, a certain propulsion force, and then this propulsion force is exactly balanced by the fluid drag force that is acting on them. And this balance of forces and torques is, is what sets the swimming speed. And so, so effectively, this, this little um, swimmer here is a force dipole, because there are two forces, opposite forces, that cancel each other, that act on the fluid. And this force dipole generates this sort of a dipolar field, flow field. Now, if you look at a different organism, a swimming alga, this Chlamydomonas reinhardti I introduced in the previous slide, again, the near field, well, that depends on the stage in which of motion in which it is. But if you time average this flow field, well, you get something that looks complicated. Now, if you look at the far field, again, the time average looks similar to the bacterial, to the bacterial flow. So they all live by the same universal rules. And the, because they all live in the regime of Stokes flow, so zero Reynolds number flow. And the, the three most important features, perhaps, of Stokes flow are that it's instantaneous. So in the sense that, well, try uh, thinking of swimming in a, in a swimming pool full of honey. If you stop moving, you come to an immediate stop. There is no inertial effect. So in a way, these organs have to move all the time in order to, to propel. Now, if there is no driving force, there is no velocity, because it's the balance of drag force and the propulsion force that the organism is internally able to generate to, um, that sets the swimming speed. Well, that's a matter of the name we come up with, whether walking is an inertialist phenomenon. Well, I'm not sure. I had a pre pretty bad fall on a bicycle recently, so that was cer certainly inertial. Um, and sw well, well the, the, the thing that differs here is that swimming is a force-free phenomenon. That drag and propulsion have to balance this to give the dipolar flow. Another interesting uh, feature that has consequences on their propulsion, on the way they move, is the kinematic reversibility of Stokes flows. So that's an experiment probably... Um, oops. Let's see if I'm going to... if I can... Oh, it's, it's working here. It's not working here. Right, so what happen what's happening here, there are two coaxial cylinders, and the space between them is filled with a very viscous fluid, silicon oil, to have zero Reynolds number in macro scale. Now, we inject um, colored dye, and we turn the inner cylinder, and by that we smear out the, the, the dye across the fluid. So we're stirring the fluid, and it mixes. Now what we do, we retrace so, so we turn it back. So we are giving it the same number of twists, but in the opposite direction. <laughs> well, you have to believe me, or you have to do it yourself. <laughs> and here we go. There is, a, there is a bit of smearing due to molecular diffusion here. But, but basically, everything comes back to its original, to its original um, shape. Now, that, this, is, this, is, this looks really brilliant. And, it's completely counterintuitive, given our kitchen or bathtub experiences. But, but this is a very important thing for them to, to, to well, not think about, but maybe account for. Um, because if you reverse the forces, you reverse the direction of velocity. So if you, if you can exactly reverse the forces, you can trace your trajectories back in time. Now, the consequence of that for uh, swimming microorganisms is the so-called scallop theorem. So think of a scallop that is something that is able to, to move its well, a clam that is able to open and close. And this clam, so what clams do, they, they open, then they, they insert water inside, and then they close, and they eject that water, and by that they propel. Now, this doesn't work at all if you're too small, because it's a one-parameter, it's basically a one-parameter transformation, and whatever you gain by opening, you lose by, by closing, because there is no inertia. Well, by the same principle, fish do not swim in honey, because whatever that f hypothetical fish would gain by flapping its tail to the left, it would lose by flapping its tail back to the right. So in a way, the, the rate at which they are doing it, unless it's really, really high, doesn't really matter, because it doesn't, as long as the Reynolds number is zero, it doesn't matter. So you can see that, for example, now, oh, am I able to make it? Yeah, so this is a mechanical fish. That's a very, very clever design, There's just a rubber band that you, that you twist an enough number of times so that it moves the paddle. Now, if you, if you insert that fish in golden syrup, 
th so this is a British movie, so that's golden syrup. Well, <laughs> um, it should be honey, really. But it doesn't, it, it's not doing very well. And sadly, it's now dying. So, but if you, if you want to do better than that, well, you need a different morphology. So if you take a mechanical bacterium, same, de same design, but with two corkscrew-like helicoflagella, well, that's doing pretty all right. It's moving slowly. Well, in terms of effectiveness, in terms of energetic consideration, it costs a lot of energy to move in a viscous fluid. However, if, you, if your strategy is right, you can do, you can do quite okay. Right, so these are the um, physical limitations. This is something that these organisms have to work with. Now, again, biology is diversity. So I'm going to now introduce, well, a basic concept of m propulsion in the micro world that different organisms use. Because I, I've, I've shown you already this, this, this gallery of, um, of different strategies of moving. Um, now I'm going to give you some more details. So if we look at the tree of life, so the how these organisms um, can be positioned on the tree of life, there, is a, there are prokaryotic cells, so cells in which there are no, no nuclei, and there are eukaryotic cells, and we are somewhere here. But then there is an awful lot of different um, unicellular organisms that swim, so bacteria and archaea are, are on one side of this tree, so they are prokaryotic cells, and ciliates and flagellates, so the chlamydomonas or the tetrahymena I've shown you are on the other side of that tree. And this actually makes a difference, because these two branches of that tree are very different. So this is a prokaryotic organism. So this is a little sausage with a little helicoflagellum, and it's moving this flagellum, and by that... Now this is, this is a sperm cell. This is a completely different organism, it's a eukaryotic organism, and you see that the way it's moving its tail, it's slightly different. Now, why is that? Well, this is, this is roughly because they have a different structure of these flagella. So what bacteria do, like E. coli here, so they, well, E. coli is particular in the sense that it has a bunch of these flagella. And what it does, it moves all the flagella, or all it can do is it can rotate the flagella. The flagella are completely inert structures that can be rotated at the base of the cell body. So it rotates all of them counter in a counterclockwise manner, and by a hydrodynamic mechanism, they all come together and they bundle together. And it rotates that bundle, and by that it propels. But now it has to turn somehow. And the way it turns, it's one of the motors changes the direction of rotation from counterclockwise to clockwise, and then it Th that, that leads to the destruction of that bundle, a random reorientation of the cell, and then it, ba it goes back to its counterclockwise mode, and it bundles them together. So, this, because if not that, for these bacteria, the only reorientation mechanism would be rotational diffusion, and that would be too slow. So what they do, they randomly, they, 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 they do this run and tumble motion, in which they randomly switch between a run mode and a tumble mode, and then a run mode. So this is all they do. And now they do, it, they do it because their flagella are completely inert. They are, they, they are attached to a, 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 a motor, a molecular motor, and the only thing that this molecular motor can do is rotate, clockwise or counterclockwise. So it's a very simple mechanism. And the only twist on that is that it has an elastic, the flagellum is connected to the motor by an elastic hook. And this is, this is the elastic bit. And the elastic bits are important because elasticity is actually something that breaks the kinematic reversibility. So it's not as simple as the scallop. So this is for prokaryotic flagella. Now if you look at the eukaryotic flagellum, so here is a prokaryotic flagellum, this inert, um, very slender structure. Now a eukaryotic flagellum, as compared to the prokaryotic flagellum, is much thicker, and it has a complicated internal structure. So, so this is us now, this is eukaryotic cells. So how they look like, well, they, they, they have a structure called 9 plus, two, uh, 9 plus 2, so they have 9 doublets of microtubules, so this is a scaffolding basically, 9 doublets of microtubules around uh, a central 2 microtubules, so that's why 9 plus 2. So these microtubules are fairly rigid structures, and between them there are dynein proteins, and there are molecular, there are molecular um, cargo carriers. So there are, there are proteins which are able to attach and walk along these scaffolds. 
Now, what it, by that, they are able to generate internally stresses along the whole flagellum. And so this is the main difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms, that these are inert, but these are able to actively generate stresses along the flagellum, and therefore they, they are able to impose certain modes of deformation on this flagellum. Now then, if you look at, the, well, naturally, eukaryotic flagellar beating is much, much more complicated. And you can see all the all different patterns. Um, and if you try to classify them, you can see planar undulatory waves, which are nice for modeling. But then there are much more uh, complicated structures, um, like helical waves. Um, there are spiral waves that can propagate from base to tip or from tip to base. So differently, in different physiological conditions for different organisms, we, organ we, we, we observe different modes of motion. But basically, what is happening, there is a flagellum sticking out, and this flagellum is, is able to generate some kind of an active motion. Now, a subgroup I've shown you of that are ciliates, so the organisms that are hairy. And so this is an, um, this is an example encompassing roughly 200 different ciliates from, uh, from Institute of Freshwater Ecology in Windermere in the UK. And so it's a beautiful drawing from the 50s showing the, the vast diversity of these, of these organisms. So the common factor, again, is that there are hairy bits on them. And these hairy bits are something that is, is moving. And, well, you see that different, different shapes and different physiological needs induce different types of motion. But basically, all of them, what they do, well, one cilium is not very effective in moving the, such a big organism. So they have to do more than that. And uh, so they move collectively. And the, the way they move is, uh, is called metachronal waves. And this is, think of a Mexican wave at a stadium, when people in, from neighboring rows just stand up and, and, and wave. And so these cilia are able to move in a concerted way, and so that the, there is a disturbance propagating along the surface of the body, and that is able to create systematically, well, flows around the, an organism. So this is on the scale of a, a couple of microns. And so, so now how they achieve it, it's a mixture of um, internal coupling within the organism and hydrodynamic mechanisms. So there is not one clear answer to, to the question, how do they achieve that? There are hydrodynamics helps, but there is basal coupling within the organism is also needed. But now the point is that each individual cilium moves in a very simple way. It has, it has basically, uh, well, it can generate helical waves, but what it does, it, it moves with two strokes. So if you have a, a cilium, it moves, it does a power stroke when it pumps the fluid, and then it does a recovery stroke when it goes back. So we're pumping, so power and recovery. And by that, they, in, a, in this 3D sort of motion, they are able to, to, to pump the fluid, and if there's many of them, they can coordinate. And this is actually very helpful, because it's not only helpful for creating flow around the swimming microorganism, it's also helpful within our bodies. So, for example, this is in, uh, inside a fallopian tube, so this is in, in the ovary duct. So this is, and this is um, a bunch of cilia around on, in the fallopian tube that transport the mucus. So this is a, a vitally important process for our um, uh, for our fertility. But not only there, in our lungs there are similar structures. Also in bigger cells, like plant cells, plant cells also are covered with cilia, and these cilia move and they, they therefore are able to transport the fluid inside the cell. In, and the process is called cytoplasmic streaming. So motion inside the cell is also facilitate, facilitated by the presence of these cilia that, that, that move. I've recently heard a very interesting talk also about the cerebrospinal fluid in the, in the brain. That apparently when we sleep, the cerebrospinal fluid is moving at a much higher rate than normally to wash off every, so all the, all the garbage that is produced. Uh, yes, yeah, so that we can forget and we can get rid of the, of the, of the non unnecessary products in the mind. But now, now the way it, what, what, what happens there, well, that's why we need to get enough sleep in the first place. But one of the um, factors that facilitate this process are, are, is the presence of cilia in the brain as well. So cilia are, gener are responsible for microscale generation of flow. And this is a very important um, feature I'm going to, to continue talking about. Um, now, the, 
th there comes the question, so how do we really model that? Because we can model that on the level of individual cilia, it's an extremely complicated dynamic process. But then if you look from far away, and this is what Blake realized in the 70s, well, we can maybe forget about this, this, this complicated pattern of waves that's happening there and just think of a surface having an imposed slip flow. So a distribution of slip flow on the surface that is able to generate the motion of the surrounding fluid. And this was called the squirmer model. And of course, by analyzing different, different fl flow distributions on a sphere, you can, you can produce different flow fields. And this was something that people started to... Um, well, this is an, an idea that, that had a continuation in artificial swimmers, which is something I'm going to devote the second half of my talk to. So that we can generate surface flow somehow, and then we resemble living organisms if you look from far, from far away, from enough far away. Um, now to, to just give you the a flavor on how these how fast these things move if you have a if you if you're a flagellate so these are eukaryotic cells so if you're a flagellate like chlamydomonas and you do your breaststroke like um, motion so here we gather data on 112 flagellates that was that were, that were available in the literature and you see that the swimming speeds are mostly in on, of the order of half a micron per second so if you think of the size of these organisms being well, roughly 10, 20 microns, 50 microns, they are pretty fast. In terms of body length per second covered, they are faster than we are running. Now, if you look at ciliates, they are, they are much larger, and so therefore they are, they are also much faster, so it's of the order of, of, of one millimeter per second. So, so these, these can be seen very well under a microscope because they are, they are uh, 100 microns, 200 microns, so up to uh, half a millimeter or a millimeter. Nevertheless, still the, with these speeds, the Reynolds numbers for, for these guys are, are fairly small. So now that, that, that brings us to, to the idea that maybe, well, we want to be able to use these, somehow conclude from these mechanisms of motion to be able to produce something that is able to, to, to propel in microscale. Of course, the end goal would be, or people would say about um, drug delivery, nanorobots, so that we will be, if we are able to master how these guys move, maybe we can use that to produce robots that would do the task that we, wanted to, that we want them to do. And then, well, there is many ideas on how to do that, and vast efforts have been devoted to this end over the past, um, well, tens of years. Now, one mechanism that comes to mind that is in an interesting opportunity is the mechanism of diffusiophoresis. So think of a surface. Think of a surface that is chemically active. For example, it can catalyze a reaction. And effectively, that would produce solute, some solute in the fluid around it. Now, if this surface is chemically active in a non-uniform way, there, are, there will be places in which it would, it would pr produce more solute than in others. Now, if you add to that that there is a short-range interaction potential, either attraction or repulsion of solute, which is a sum of uh, electrostatic interactions, van der Waals interactions, exclusion interactions, but there is some short-range potential, uh, then what happens, well, there will, be, there will be regions of higher concentration and lower concentration. And if there will be regions of higher and lower concentration, there will be a flow that would naturally be induced in this system. And that flow would be proportional to the gradient of concentration of, these, of, of that solute. Now, if, if we put it in more specific terms, well, if we think of this concentration profile for the solute to be an equilibrium concentration profile um, W with an exponential distribution given by that potential, and we write the momentum balance equation for the, for the fluid, just to spare you the details, um, well, we get a slip flow that far away from the surface, so outside of this, short of this thin interaction layer, we get a slip flow that is proportional to the tangential gradient of concentration of that solute, with the proportionality constant called the surface mobility that depends on the details of these molecular interactions and on the temperature. But the, the, but the whole point being that we are able to generate, by that, we are able to generate slip flow that is proportional to the tangential gradient of concentration. And now if you put your numbers in, 
it turns out that these flows can be generated to be of order of micrometers per second, which is bingo, which is great, because this is exactly the biological scale of flows. Yes, so, 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 so this is all within the Stokes flow. So on the scale, well, if we think of, so let me give a specific example of a system in which we think about this, which is a particle, which, which, which is called the Janus particle, and I'll come back to that. But if we have a particle on the surface of which we are able to non-homogeneously generate these gradients, there will be flow around it, and the resulting, well, if we are able to induce flow around it, it will move. So this will be the result of momentum conservation, that if, if you create flow, you will create also motion of that, of, that, um, of that particle. And so the classical example now is the Janus particle. So Janus is, was a Roman god that was known to have two faces, one at the back of the head and one at the front. And so these particles have two faces. And the typical design is you take a, a sphere, you cover half of it with gold and the other half with platinum, and you put it in a hydrogen peroxide solution. So it's a tabletop experiment, if your particle is small enough. Then they will start moving, because what happens in this, the, the platinum part uh, catalyzes the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. And so you get, you get oxygen that is um, dissolved in the fluid. And the concentration imbalances will drive the flow that will produce motion of these guys. And so in this, in this video, you have a, a bunch of these Janus particles moving. The, no, it's platinum that's important here. Uh, gold, I think gold is used... Uh, I, I think the, 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 the um, idea of that design was to have mm, the coating of similar densities. Because if you have a density imbalance, you will have an additional torque that would orient these, these guys. No, so this is a well on the biological scale, so a couple of micrometers. Y y we can go down with that, but then Brownian motion, of course. So if you if you want to properly account for the motion, if they are too small, you have to include rotational on translation of Brownian motion. B but basically, this is an idea that well, th this is the, the proof of concept. So y we are able to generate um, motion from from chemical activity of the surface. Now, if we take a deeper look at this flow generation mechanism, there are two things to, to, to think about. So one is the concentration, so the process of diffusion of that solute, and the other one is the flow. So for the transport of solute to make things easier, we are looking at the, so, um, so the transport equation for the solute, uh, in, we are looking at it in the limit of low Peclet number, so when the diffusion of solute is much faster than the advection of solute, and then, then it simplifies to the Laplace's equation for, for the solute in, in the domain. But, but now we need to think about the proper boundary conditions for this equation, so the, what the surface chemistry is dictating here. And what this, uh, so one way to model it is to say that we have a fixed flux boundary condition on the surface, so that the normal gradient of concentration of this solute is, um, well, is prescribed, and it is prescribed differently in different places. So, so this A can be a field on this, on this surface. Now, you can complicate that. You can say that we have a one-step chemical reaction where this activity here, which is it's called A for activity, where this activity is proportional to the local, grade, uh, to the local concentration. Um, now we are working in this, in this context of this talk, we are working in the limit of low dam curler number when, the, the, again, the, the, the diffusion of reactants much, is much faster than the reaction rates, and so, so we use this, this fixed flux boundary conditions. But, but of course, more complicated um, schemes are also possible. So now we have this concentration field that's just determined by solving the Laplace's equation with appropriate activity on the surface of a potato-shaped particle we consider. And now this feeds into the flow. So for the flow, because it's a low Reynolds number regime, we have the Stokes equations. So this is the Navier-Stokes that simplifies to Stokes, which is nice and linear, with the incompressibility condition. 
And now the boundary condition for the flow is that we impose a surface slip flow, and the surface slip flow is, is just mobility times the tangential gradient of concentration. So here, the normal gradient of concentration is prescribed, and the tangential gradient of concentration produces flow. Now, if the Peclet number is not zero, so if there is advection of that solute happening because of the flow, well, this thing gets more complicated because there is a feedback from the flow to the concentration problem. But we focus on this, on this simpler case. Now, just a, a, a remark that this is um, a more universal mechanism um, because instead of, instead of uh, thinking about the chemical activity, you can think very well about electrophoresis or thermophoresis. So if you are able to create gradients of something along the surface, then you will be able to create flow. So particularly, there are now designs in which people take particles and they shine laser light on them in a directed way so that they heat up half of the particle. And when you heat up half of the particle, you will create flow because of the temperature imbalances. So that's another way. So it's not entirely self-propelled in this way because you need an external input, but the, but the, the, the fact that energy is generated locally well, still gives you this sort of active matter flavor to, to your system. So you can use that with, with temperature, you can use that with, um, with charge density. And so, so the mechanism gen is general, but we focus on diffusiophoresis. Now the question is, okay, so, so we know that by, by coating things in an asymmetric way, we can produce flow. But if things are coated in a symmetric way, we can also induce flow by having um, the shape that is asymmetric enough. And so one example of, of that is this, oops, sorry. No, that's not going in the right direction. This is. Now, now this is one example, so think of a, 2D, uh, of a channel, of a pipe. And this is a 2D cross-section of that pipe, in which the pipe has, a, has the outer cylinder and the inner, the inner cylinder in the pipe is deformed in such a way. So it, it has a fancy shape. Because it's fancy shaped and it has, let's say, uniform chemical activity, if you put something that is able to, well, that, that this, this activity is able to catalyze a reaction, there will be non-uniform concentration of solute throughout this region. And therefore, there will be flow, and these are the flow lines. So, so you create a swirling flow around by, by, this, by this sort of uh, a design. So this is, this is interesting because in microscale, it's really hard to mix the fluid. It's hard to move the fluid. So to move the fluid in a microchannel, you need to have a pressure difference across the channel. Now, this is a mechanism that requires chemical, the chemical reactivity of this, of, this, of this substance, but it's able to locally generate flow and locally create mixing. And so there, there are other designs. So this is a, a phoretic Pac-Man, as my friend termed it. So, so, so if, you, if you put these, well, if you, if you assemble a system like that, there will also be concentration differences that will attract these little spheres towards the big sphere. And so, to be more specific, I'm going to give you a, a short example of a phoretic pumping system in two dimensions. Um, something we did with Eric Lauger and Seb Michelin in Cambridge. So, well, again, back to this problem of flow in a pipe. Think of a, a pipe, well, with two concentric cylinders and there's fluid flowing, or there's fluid in between them. If the, the arrangement is symmetric, even if the surfaces are chemically active in some way, there is no flow by symmetry. But as soon as you push the inner cylinder to the side, well, then you can, you, you're able to create flow. And so this is a particular design we've looked at. So it's a cross-section of a, of a channel in which the inner cylinder is eccentric with respect to the outer cylinder. Well, and then, well, the natural thing to do is to introduce cylindrical bipolar coordinates and try to solve the Laplace's equation in cylindrical bipolar coordinates because there the are two coordinates, then sigma and tau instead of um, x and y, and the, the, the lines of constant tau give you, give you um, cylinders of well, different eccentricity and different size ratio. And so to spare you the mathematical details, um, well, Laplace's equation, the good news is Laplace's equation is separable in 2D and it takes a very simple form. And now we, on the outer cylinder, we impose a Dirichlet boundary condition of zero concentration. And on the inner cylinder, we prescribe a chemical activity. And then there is an analytical solution for the concentration field inside this, 
inside this, this channel. And this is a, an example of a concentration field. If you have the inner cylinder active, the outer cylinder, um, zero concentration, there is more stuff gathering here than anywhere else. And so this will drive the flow. So now if we, transit, if, we, if we now try to solve, okay, so we have the concentration profile, which is the input for our flow problem. Now if we look at the flow problem, the easiest thing to do if you have a two-dimensional flow is to introduce a stream function. So a stream function, um, a stream function gives the velocity components by appropriate derivatives. So this is the concept of a stream function. And moreover, it satisfies the biharmonic equation inside the, the, the fluid domain. Now, the appropriate boundary conditions are that there is no velocity on the outer cylinder, on the surface, so it's a typical no-slip surface. Now, the inner cylinder has a certain slip velocity prescribed by, by the concentration profile. So you get a biharmonic equation, which can be, well, in the 1920s, where people were still able to calculate things, um, um, a gentleman called Jeffrey noticed that if you not if you don't focus on the stream function, but if you divide it by a certain geometric factor, it's just an ordinary. So, so it's a PDU with constant coefficients, and that that has an analytic solution, which looks lo longish, but it's there. Now, if you have the stream function, the point is you have the streamlines because this, the the, st the stream function is constant along streamlines, and so you can you can plot for a given for a given geometry, you can plot the flow field. And the flow field in this case, well, by symmetry, it's well, uh, um, upper lower part symmetric. But it, these are two vortices, essentially, created in one here and one here, and they roll in the opposite directions. Then we ask the question, OK, so we have a design that produces flow. Now, what design is the most effective one? So which design maximizes some quantity l uh, related to that flow? Um, well, then the question becomes, what do you want to optimize? We, we thought that we wanted to optimize the total flux, so the amount of fluid that we, we are able to pump. And then conveniently, the flux between, so if you take the difference of the stream function between two points, gives you the total flux through a line connecting these two points. So, so we, we tried to optimize the flux as a, mm, for different ra radius ratio and for different eccentricity. And so it turns out that the maximal eccentricity, so the, the inner cylinder pushed towards the side, the most produces the best result in terms of flow. But it, the result is different, of course, for different size ratio of these cylinders. And then comes the interesting question, what is the optimal size ratio? And the optimal size ratio turns out to be roughly 0.43, which has nothing to do with square root of 2, as far as I know. However, well, you can understand there is an optimum, because if the inner cylinder is too small, then it's only able to generate the flow locally. So it's no good for, for pumping the fluid outside. Now, if the inner cylinder is too large, there is not enough space, and there, the, friction, the wall friction dominates the, the whole pumping process. So there is an optimum in the, in, in the middle, and that optimum is, is actually here. So it's an minimum, it's an optimum, in terms of dissipation versus surface driving. And of course, it depends on the gap size. But, th but the point is that, you can o is that you can optimize that design. Now, if you, if, you, if you relax your boundary condition that it's not fixed flux, but it's a one-step chemical reaction that I mentioned before, so the damp color number is non-zero, so the reactants don't diffuse so fast. Well, if you, if you consider non-zero damp color number, that lowers the efficiency, but it doesn't ch uh, change the qualitative picture. So the optimum is, is, still, is still there where we found it. So this was one example of using this asymmetry by design to generate flow. Now another phase of phoretic flow is swimming. So if you have a particle that is able to swim because of the, of the way you design it. And so we're back to the, to the problem of swimming of a, of a potato-shaped particle. So now we consider a particle in which we have an arbitrary um, coverage with activity and mobility. And th so these are the two factors we can play with. And of course, in the frame of the particle, so we want the, the velocity, we want the particle to have a, a constant uh, translational and angular velocity. And so there is a way to calculate these quantities from the surface, fr from the surface slip flow distribution. 
Now, we wanted, and of course, as there are many designs, these, these surface slip flows can take a very complicated form. However, well, so, so the simplest thing you can do, and people, people have done, is the Janus particle. But the Janus particle, well, has a, you can, you can, it, it has a uniform surface mobility, but it has activity on one hemisphere, but not on the other. So that is able to generate translational motion because of the axial symmetry of the whole thing. Now you can play around with this coverage, make it more covered, less covered. That changes the surface flow. That changes the, the concentration profile. But it doesn't change the quality, the, well, the, the quality or what we see. We see translational motion. And the only reorientation is due to um, Brownian motion, rotational Brownian motion. Now there's plenty of experimental realizations of these Janus particles. So, you c and, uh, so, so this, um, this graph shows you the speed versus the size of these experimental, experimental artificial systems, like these Janus rods, Janus spheres, chiral Janus particles. Um, so from A to probably Q, um, th there's a number of these designs. Now the interesting things as I mentioned before, is that if you look at the motion of, of bacteria, like E. coli, which is somewhere here, or, or typical spermatozoa, or Theovolume myus, which is a bacterium, which is the, one of the fastest swimming bacteria we know, well, these fall nicely together on the, on, the, on the scale. So we are able to produce artificial particles that are close in size, both in size and in speed, to, to the biological colleagues. Now, we wanted to investigate so to what extent you can take a particle that is symmetric, like a Janus particle, and play around with it to achieve not only translational motion, but something more complicated. And so what inspired us was this paper called Glancing a uh, Angle Metal Evaporation Synthesis of Catalytic Swimming Janus Colloids with Well-Defined Angular Velocity. So that sounds all very complicated, but the point is, if you produce Janus particles, what you do, you, you typically take a bunch of spheres, you put them on the surface, and then you spray metal from above. And that's how you cover hemispheres with gold or platinum. Now, these two gentlemen, what they did, they, they, they started spraying the metal from the side. And so because of the mutual shadowing of these spheres, they produced um, patterns of, of platinum on the, on the golden particle that were not hemispherical but they were somewhat more complicated. So they produced these guys that you see in, in these photos here, and then they noticed that these particles have a pronounced and well-defined angular velocity when they're moving, so that they don't only move translationally, but they also rotate. Well, uh, yes, of course, so, so, so they do, and they, they have seen that when they, when they change the, the angle at which they were spraying the metal, they changed the rotational velocity of most of these particles. But then we thought, well, that's an awfully complicated geometry to deal with. But then we, we, we wanted to ask a more general question. So what is the resulting motion if I take a Janus particle, so if I take a particle and I pattern it arbitrarily with activity and mobility? So what can I get? What sort of motion can I get if I, if I put patches of activity and mobility on the surface? And so, in a more abstract way, I, um, I can th I've, I'm thinking of, as a, at the start, the input is my activity coverage in terms of, of spherical coordinates on the surface of that sphere, and my mobility. And it turns out that there, is, there are analytical expressions for the resulting translational and rotational velocity. That goes by, by basically solving the Laplace's equation by a spherical harmonics equation. And I will spare you the, the juicy bits here because there is no point in introducing these, all these quantities, but the point here is that there is an analytical solution for the concentration in terms of spherical harmonics. Well, of course. So then we have the slip flow, which is somewhat more complicated, but it's, it just derives from the tangential gradient of this concentration. And then there are analytical expressions in the frame of the particle for the resulting linear velocity. And there are expressions for the resulting angular velocity. But let's not talk about these at the moment, but let's look at the structure of these solutions. So what, can, what solutions can we get? Well, obviously we can get pure translation, but that is by axisymmetric design, and this is the Janus particle. Now we can also get pure rotation of this particle, so we can get particles that are only spinning but not translating. 
We can also induce collinear translation and rotation, which just looks you know, like boring. But we can also get orthogonal translation and rotation, and it, the, the most interesting case is that when, when we have an arbitrary angle between the translational and rotational velocity, because then we get helical trajectories. And helical trajectories, of course, we like them because they, they resemble bacterial trajectories. Because bacteria, by the helical nature of their tails, they, they never translate in straight lines. They are slightly, the, their trajectories are slightly helical. And now, so, so given the, the, the coverage pattern, we can, um, we can obviously create, we, we can determine what the motion will be. Now, the way I like to think about it, so there you can give examples of pure translation, as I, I've told you, you can give an example of a coverage that produces pure rotation, but the most important bit, I think, is the patch module. So we try to understand that in more, sort of, less mathematical, bar, but more um, qualitative terms. What sort, how do you design the particle to get the, the predefined type of motion? And so if we think about two patches for now, for simplicity. So if we think about a sphere that has an activity side and a mobility side, so one patch that is active and one patch that is able to create flow. Well, this might, ex this might as well mean that the whole thing is mo has a certain mobility, but this patch has a slightly higher mobility, because qualitatively that doesn't change anything. Or everything is active, but this patch is more active than the rest. Well, then a given pair of patches produces translational motion of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole sphere and produces rotational motion, and these can be very well quantified. And the, so this is basically the velocity in increment that produces, and that velocity produces both translation and rotation. And because of the well, nature of our boundary conditions, and if these patches are non-overlapping, well, we can superpose the motion resulting from different pairs of patches, and by that, we can understand what sort of motion we design by, by a given patch coverage. So to give you, again, a couple of examples of that, if we look at this example, when we have on the pole, there is an active patch, and there are two mobility patches on the equator. Well, that will produce flow that will produce only translational motion because the, the flow increments will be directed from the mobility patches to, to the activity patch but they will cancel each other, cancel, well, they will, they will just have a translational effect. Now, if you want your particle to rotate instead of translating, well, you can put all the patches on the equator in such a way, well, that the, the direction from the mobility to the activity patch will produce increments that would add up, and that would make the particle rotate. Now, you can join the two. You can, make the, you can take patches on the pole and patches on the equator to produce collinear translation and rotation. And of course, the design I mentioned in the beginning, so just two patches produces translation that is perpendicular to rotation, so that will produce a, a, a circular trajectory. But then if you take two patches, or let's say two patches of mobility, but at different distances from the pole, so from the active patch, then you create the velocity, translation and rotational velocity that are orient oriented at an angle to, to each other. And of course, you can quantify this and find this angle exactly. And so, if the, the input being now the translational and rotational velocity in the lab trajectories, we can get different, differently character, different characteristics of helices these guys produce. And so this is an example of a design that is hopefully, so we now want to get someone to, to synthesize uh, at least particles that would be, well, use the same principles to, to see whether we can really play around and control the degree of trans well, the, or the, the, the mutual orientation of the translational and rotational velocity and create arbitrary predefined helical trajectories of these generous particles. And so, to conclude, this, this, this work has been done um, in collaboration with Eric Lauga in Cambridge, Sebastian Michelin in Ecole Polytechnique, and Shang Yi Gri, who's now at uh, Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. And um, with these two examples of swimming and pumping by phoretic flows, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, okay, questions, comments? You never mentioned the energy. Where does the energy come from to propel these 
animals. Yes. So, so in the um, in the diffusiophoresis, so it's all it's all happening provided there is enough fuel. So there is this hydrogen peroxide, for example, that is that is able to provide the uh, solute that's needed. Because of course, a lot of energy is dissipated by the flow. So the energy input is either chemical energy of the solute, in this case, or in thermophoresis, well, you have to somehow sustain temperature gradients across the system. Well, yes. So there is an in energy input, but the point is here in these active systems, the energy input is on the local level and not on the external field level. Uh, okay, anyone else? I would like to go back to the point of the prokaryotic uh, flagellum motion. So I was wondering if you have that uh, organism inside a jet stream, which is laminar, how is this going to do the turning? Inside a laminar stream? Yes. But a given flow or any flow? Mm. Well, b what, what happens, more, well, first of all, these, these, these prokaryotic flagella, they are, they are inert, but they are just polymerized biological filaments. And they, they come in a variety of, well, they, they also have a couple of conformations in which they can be. But the, the point is that there, there is an uh, effect called the weather vane effect, by which it is known that bacteria um, tend to re -attack. So if, if they are placed in a shear flow, they tend to swim upstream. They tend to orient to swim upstream. So it's a, it's a more complicated setting because there is also a cell body there. The cell body is the main source of, of drag for the, fl for, the, um, for the bacterium, for example, whereas the, the tail is generating the, the thrust force. And so, so this, this whole geometric object orients differently in flow. And the flow can deform slightly the flagellum, but it's not as important for, for the, the formation of the flagellum. It's more important for reorienting the whole cell because of acting with drag forces on the cell body. Uh, okay, more questions? So, do you have any idea how to put those patches on those particles? Because so you can do these hemispheres quite easily and then shining uh, at some angle, you can also do it, but then to put those small uh, patches you want uh, did you did you speak with well, being, about being it? Absolutely not an expert. Yeah, I can answer. <laughs> um, yes. So, so so by surrounding these spheres <laughs> with objects of different shape, it's possible just to control the amount of of um, of that metal that getting on the surface. So it's not only that you can you can arrange spheres on mm -hmm. the surface, you can arrange other other shaped objects and by that you can prevent the metal from getting into there. So th but there are more clever tricks with designing these particles. But it's always about well, a clever way of, of evaporation or clever mm -hmm. way of mm -hmm. shining okay. light on them. Okay, so my question regards the uh, the the uh, flow generated by the diffusion. So, in the direction of which is used in these Janus particles, you use the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So, if you've got one uh, one type of molecule which decomposes into two, uh, is it possible to reverse it and, and, and consider reactions in which you synthesize something uh, on the on the surface? Would it make any difference in principle? <laughs> I think it wouldn't make too much of a difference, except for the fact that if you ha if you're producing stuff, well, be be there's still interaction between the be mm -hmm. be between the surface and the solute, so it's either attracted or repelled to the to the surface. Um, my only worry is that if the concentrations of the stuff get t too high, the fixed flux boundary condition wouldn't really be appropriate mm -hmm. anymore, and so you have to take a f well a, a one-step chemical reaction to model that um, appropriately. But that's probably specific to the process. To you mentioned a couple of times during your talk that uh, you can reasonably well describe the flow pattern around a body or a, or a bacterium if you're far away enough. So how uh, far is far away enough for you? And because these are not self-similar solutions, so I would want probably the answer uh, depends on the vert uh, viscosity of the fluid. But what car is critical scale of which? Uh, uh, which you give to, to move away to get the, the reasonable, uh, simple solutions of the of the flow patterns. Yes, right. So, um, well, let me answer by by example here. Now, now, what I'm saying is that far field is easy because far field we understand very well. 
because it's just a, 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 a just a, a dipolar flow. Now, as in this example, you see well, that if you get well enough, like well, one two body lengths from so 10 microns from the from the from the bacterium, which itself is one two microns. Uh, large, then you, you're, you're good with only the far field description. Now, if you want to include more, you just need to put in the, de the geometric details of, of the bacterium, and this is something people do. And these um, <coughs> near field flows are also fairly well understood. What you need is you need, well, in a mathematical sense, you need extra derivatives of these, of these four dipoles to account for higher order multiple flows. Now, yes, so this is in the frame of the swimmer, so, but it, it moves in, in, in this direction. However, there are swimmers, so depending on the sign of this force dipole, there are so-called pushers and pullers. So this is a pusher because it drags the fluid in from the sides and ejects it at the front at the back. Now, the pullers are organisms which drag the fluid from the front at the back and eject it to the side, but they are still able to propel. Uh, okay, one more question. So, uh, how would a human look like in that uh, picture when he is swimming? In honey? Uh, yeah, for example. <laughs> so, is there some exp are there some experiments that, you know, well, uh, as far, far field or something? As much as it would be <laughs> tempting to see an experiment of someone swimming in honey, I would very much like to see that. Um, Yeah, but this is, this is non-Newtonian, so this is slightly more tricky. And, of course, there are non-Newtonian bits in the bacterial world. Some of them swim in the mucus that is not a uh, Newtonian fluid. But anyway, uh, so, well, I, I think as, as long as we, are, as we would be moving, there would be motion of the fluid created. As, uh, because, well, then there are the same limitations. We stop, the fluid comes to an immediate stop. So it would, it would require um, endless actuation of the fluid to see a systematic flow pattern, because these guys are able to rotate their tail indefinitely long. I don't know if we would be able to, <laughs> to, to just move <laughs> our legs infinitely long so that we see a stable flow field mm -hmm. around us. But it would be very interesting to see. Okay. Uh, so let's thank Maciek once again. Thank you.